I would like to start by first acknowledging that uh, we are gathered on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg peoples. We are grateful to, to them for the opportunity that they have given us to live on this beautiful land. It has been over a year since Russia's brutal assault on the sovereignty of Ukraine, and particularly the Ukrainian people. It is absolutely inspiring to see the resilience of Ukrainians within Ukraine and outside Ukraine as they withstand this brutal invasion of their motherland. The government of Canada and its people remain steadfast in our support for Ukraine, its people, and its government. We continue to use the tools at our disposal to support Ukrainians. Canada has provided $2 billion in financial assistance, extended our military support and equipment, and launched Ukrainian sovereignty bonds to support the operations of the Ukrainian government. Nous avons pris des mesures pour soutenir les Ukrainiens et leurs familles fouillant l'invasion russe, en mettant en ouvre des mesures d'immigration afin qu'ils puissent trouver temporairement refuge au Canada, en réservant des vols affrétés et en offrant des aides à l'établissement pour les aider à demeurer au Canada. Plus de 123 000 Ukrainiens et membres de leurs familles sont venus au Canada grâce à l'autorisation de voyage d'urgence Canada-Ukraine. It has been inspiring for me personally to see how our community right here in my community of Ottawa Center and across Ottawa has stepped up to help Ukrainians resettle here in Canada. It is really, truly a great symbol of what to be Canadian means. We have a lot more work to do to help Ukrainians in Ukraine and here in Canada. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Minister Fraser to the podium to provide an update on Canada's support for Ukraine. Thank you. Bonjour et bienvenue. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, Dobre dan. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you to share uh, the latest measures that Canada will be adopting to help continue to support Ukrainians who are fleeing Vladimir Putin's unjust uh, war of aggression. Uh, before I get too far, let me say to my colleagues, uh, MP Nafi, uh, Baker and Maloney, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, your continued support uh, for our efforts uh, is very much appreciated. Uh, and today in particular, I want to thank our hosts here at Cafe Ukraine. Um, Yaroslav, thank you so much for hosting us today. But, but more importantly than uh, uh, providing a venue for today's announcement, uh, the support that they've extended to the community uh, over the course of more than a year now. Uh, they've shared uh, often 150 to 200 people a week are coming and uh, receiving services here, uh, being welcomed and being treated with respect and dignity. Uh, and I can't think of a, a more appropriate way to share this news than by cooperating with the people who've been providing such uh, graceful supports to people in need over the course of the past year. Um, as Ukrainians continue to contend with the effects of uh, this unlawful invasion, uh, we read our, aid our message to Ukraine. Uh, Canada will continue to support you. As my colleague uh, MP Nafi mentioned uh, just a moment ago, certainly the Ukrainian people and Ukrainian territory is under attack. But so are the values that we hold most dear in Canada. Uh, my grandfather was a Second World War veteran, and he would remind me when I would uh, ask him questions about his service that you need not fight in a war on the other side of the world to defend the values uh, that we care about most. In particular, the international legal order rests on certain principles, principles like territorial integrity, sovereignty of nations, and the right to self-determination of people. The very idea that people should have a say in who makes decisions that impact the quality of life they get to enjoy. We need to defend these principles, not just with our words, but through our actions. If the UN documents that embed these values uh, are to be worth their, their weight, uh, we need to defend them uh, every day. Over the course of the past year, uh, we've extended uh, measures to support Ukraine and its people, whether it's the military uh, measures, whether it's sanctions that we've lobbied against uh, Russian officials, or whether it's the adoption of new immigration measures to provide a humanitarian visa to those seeking refuge here in Canada. Uh, what I've been most impressed by is not just the action of the, the government, uh, but the action of Canadians and communities across this country. Uh, we've seen them open their arms and open their homes in many cases uh, to welcome some of the world's most vulnerable people. 
My own parents have welcomed families to provide a temporary uh, a place to stay while they got their feet under them after they landed here in Canada. Um, the ability for Canadians to step up to provide supports to people in need should make us all very, very proud. For our part, we've provided Ukrainians and their immediate family uh, members of any nationality the opportunity to stay in Canada's temporary residence for up to three years. Uh, we've also advanced measures to ensure that they have the ability to uh, work here in Canada or study if they choose. In addition uh, to their permission, of course, we've extended certain supports, which I'll address in a moment. Le Canada continue de soutenir fermement l'Ukraine, son peuple et son gouvernement contre l'invasion illégale et injuste de Russie. C'est pourquoi le gouvernement du Canada a fourni une aide financière ainsi qu'un soutien militaire et des équipements à l'Ukraine. Nous avons également mis en place des sanctions économiques et des sanctions sur le voyage vise la Russie. Des Canadiens d'un océan à l'autre ont offert leur soutien et ont ouvert leur maison aux Ukrainiens. Today I'm pleased to share that we are announcing an extension to the Canada-Ukraine authorization for emergency travel to continue to provide a fast and safe way for Ukrainians and their families to travel to Canada. In particular, we will be extending the deadline under which Ukrainians can apply until July 15th, beyond the March 31st deadline that was in place before. Those who are approved will also benefit from an extended period during which they can arrive and will continue to be eligible for some of the supports until March 31st of 2024. We're going to continue to support Ukrainians during their transition to a new life here in Canada after their arrival, even though it may be temporary. This will include continued support for federally, federally funded temporary accommodations that will be available and will continue to provide access to one-time financial assistance to help newcomers into the program meet their basics need, basic needs upon arrival. We will also be continuing access to settlement services that have been made available to Ukrainians and their family members. And I want to say thank you in particular to those settlement service providers. You've been helping people learn languages here in Canada, whether it's French or English. You've been helping them find jobs. You've been helping them uh, with some of the soft supports, uh, not just uh, those essential services like housing and employment, uh, but teaching kids where they can sign up for soccer or where people might be able to ride the bus or open a bank account. All of the measures that we've advanced uh, build upon our previous actions to support Ukraine's security and resilience and to hold Russia accountable for its atrocities and crimes. We're going to closely monitor the ongoing needs of Ukrainians and Ukraine to see how we can continue to lend our support and help win this war. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons la prolongation de l'autorisation des voyages d'urgence Canada-Ukraine afin que les Ukrainiens et leurs familles puissent continuer à se rendre au Canada rapidement et en toute sécurité. C'est incluant nous prolégeons jusqu'au 15 juillet 2023 la date limite à laquelle les personnes se trouvant à l'étranger peuvent présenter une demande. Les personnes dont la demande a été approuvée pourront se rendre au Canada dans le cadre du programme jusqu'au 31 mars 2024. Les Ukrainiens qui se trouvent déjà au Canada peuvent demander à prolonger leur séjour au Canada et le gouvernement du Canada continuera de renoncer à tous les frais liés à ces demandes. Nous continuerons à soutenir les Ukrainiens pendant leur transition vers une nouvelle vie au Canada après leur arrivée, même si cette transition est temporaire. Les logements temporaires financés par le gouvernement fédéral continueront d'être disponibles. De plus, nous continuerons à fournir une aide financière ponctuelle pour aider les nouveaux arrivants. Nous poursuivons également les services d'établissement offerts aux Ukrainiens et aux membres de leur famille comme la formation linguistique, à l'aide, à la recherche d'emploi et des, uh, des uh, uh, mesures informelles aussi. Ces mesures s'appuient sur nos actions antérieures visant à soutenir la sécurité et la résilience de l'Ukraine et à traîner la Russie responsable de ses atrocités et de ses crimes. Nous suivons de près les besoins des Ukrainiens et nous adapterons notre réponse si nécessaire. Uh, the Canadians have stepped up to help Ukraine. Uh, Yevhenia and Christina were welcomed as a two SLGBTQI couple uh, who wondered where they would be welcomed in the world. I have to say thank you in particular to the Hillers United Church uh, where longtime members uh, wrap their arms around people to provide support in their time of need. They chose to come to Canada because of our positive support for the community and because they knew that we wouldn't be seeking to restrict their rights but instead would embrace them and provide care for themselves. In my home province, in fact, in my own constituency, you can see how people in unlikely communities have stepped up to provide support to vulnerable people. Dennis and Catherine Johnson 
an American couple who have a vacation home in the small community of Port Pickerton in Nova Scotia decided when we announced this program that they wanted to do their part to help. In particular, they offered their summer home to the Shveda family, who's now living in my community, where both parents and the family have found meaningful work and are making a contribution to the community that has offered uh, a warm welcome to them. In particular, I attended the Christmas tree lighting at Sherbrooke Village, a major tourism event every year in my home constituency, where the community came together to invite Misha and Oksana and their children, Rodion, Ilya, and Zachariah, to light the Christmas tree in front of the entire community. Uh, what a beautiful scene to see small towns and rural communities, along with big cities in this country, do their part to help support people in need. Our support for Ukrainians who are bravely defending their homes from Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine remains steadfast. That's why we're continuing to provide the ongoing support that I've announced today in helping more people find temporary safe haven in Canada. We are so grateful for the continued work from provinces, territories, municipal partners, as well as settlement service providers who've come together in support of Ukraine. Notre soutien aux Ukrainiens qui défendent courageusement le pays contre l'invasion totale de la Russie reste inébranlable. C'est pourquoi nous continuons à apporter un soutien constant à l'Ukraine et aider davantage des personnes à trouver un refuge temporaire au Canada. Nous sommes reconnaissants du travail et du soutien contenu des provinces, des territoires et des partenaires municipaux, ainsi que des fournisseurs des services d'établissement qui se sont unis pour soutenir les Ukrainiens. Et aux milliers de Canadiens qui ont ouvert leurs maisons, fait des bénévolat et embauché et soutenu les Ukrainiens pendant qu'ils sont ici, à merci. I'd like to congratulate all members of Operation Ukraine Safe Haven, including uh, CISA uh, and the Ukrainian Canadian Congress in particular, for their tireless work in supporting Ukrainians here in Canada, as well as in Ukraine. Their partnership has been invaluable in providing on the ground information to improve program and policies from the very first day. And to the thousands of Canadians who have helped by stepping up to open their homes, to volunteer, to hire and support Ukrainians while they're here, thank you. Uh, um, I'd like now to invite my friend and colleague, uh, Yvonne Baker, to the microphone to share a few words. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde, c'est un honneur d'être ici aujourd'hui avec vous, avec les membres de la communauté ukrainienne ici à Ottawa, et avec mes collègues, uh, les députés. It's an honor for me to be here today. Uh, my name is Ivan Baker, I'm the Member of Parliament for Etobicoke Centre and the Chair of the Canada-Ukraine Parliamentary Friendship Group. It's a great honor to be here with my parliamentary colleagues, of course, Minister John Fraser, but also Ottawa Centre MP Yasser Nakfi, my Etobicoke Lakeshore colleague James Maloney. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the presence of the CAFE Ukraine leadership team who are here today. And, um, and I know we'll hear more from them in a moment. And, uh, and the members of the Ukrainian-Canadian community who are here, especially the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress, for all of your work and all your leadership in communities, not just here in Ottawa, but across Canada. I have a great honor to be here today with you. And I want to start with Slava Ukraini. My grandparents, Ivan and Olena, immigrated to Canada after World War II, fleeing oppression and seeking a better life. Uh, like generations of Ukrainians who come to Canada um, since the late uh, 1800s, like the people of Ukraine who are fleeing uh, Russia's invasion today. February 24th marked a year since Russia began its further full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And the Ukrainian people have been severely outnumbered and severely outgunned, but I think they've shown tremendous courage and resolve in defending their homeland. And I think that courage has inspired Canadians and it's inspired people around the world. Notwithstanding that, the situation is dire. Uh, Russia is committing war crimes every day. There are millions of refugees, hundreds of millions of people in the global south in particular are facing famine and food shortages as a result of the war. This war is the primary cause of food and energy price inflation around the world. And this is a threat not only to Ukraine's security, but to Canada's security and to global security. So Ukrainians are not just fighting for themselves, they're fighting for us, and we need to be fighting for them. Our government, Canada, has been fighting for them uh, in the form of some of the measures that the minister outlined, whether that be military aid or humanitarian aid, financial aid, uh, sanctions on Russia, and of course, support for Ukrainians who are fleeing the war. Um, countless millions of Ukrainians have been displaced, and many have had to flee Ukraine to survive, and many of those have come to Canada. Uh, Canada has welcomed them on the Kuwait visa that the minister just made the announcement about, 
and Canadians have been so generous in welcoming them, uh, raising money, uh, finding donations, and helping them with some of the things that the minister outlined. So I'm very proud of our government's support for Ukraine in all those ways, and I'm very proud of the measure that the minister has announced today to help Ukrainians who are fleeing the war. Um, and Minister Fraser, I have to say I want to thank you for your, uh, for your leadership, for your hard work, for your determination to make sure Canada is a place that will welcome Ukrainians fleeing the war, but that is also providing those key supports that people need when they are as vulnerable as so many of the Ukrainians are when they come here to Canada. So I thank you for your leadership on that, and I thank my parliamentary colleagues for their support of that. So this announcement today and the extension of the visa, the Kuwait visa program, and the benefits associated will allow Ukrainians to continue to come to Canada and to receive the support that they need. Um, I think we can all be very proud, uh, not just here in the room, but as Canadians of the support that Canada is providing to the people of Ukraine, in Ukraine, here at home in Canada. And so I want to thank all Canadians for their generosity, and I want to thank you, Minister, for this important announcement today. Slava Ukraini. I apologize. <laughs> I had another duty, which was to introduce uh, one of the co-founders of Cafe Ukraine, Yaroslav Baran. Merci, mon ami. On behalf of Cafe Ukraine, an organic, volunteer-based, donation-based uh, project to help displaced Ukrainians, it's a great honor to welcome you, Minister, and your colleagues to our home, a home that we've created to help displaced Ukrainians get their feet under them as they take temporary shelter uh, on Canada's shores. Uh, some 150,000 Ukrainians have already taken haven in Canada since the beginning of this brutal and barbaric war. And we're pleased to, to have been able to provide various services and supports for them, from English as a second language classes, French as a second language, Ukrainian as a second language for host families, employment seminars, trauma therapy through art sessions, and the list goes on and on. But we're only able to provide this support for Ukrainians because the government of Canada has generously opened the door for Ukrainians to come and find safe harbor here. In fact, minister, members of parliament, the announcement that you've made today is a continuation of a long tradition, 130 years of generous opening of doors by Canada to Ukrainians. So on behalf of our community, I'd like to thank you for your ongoing support for Ukrainians in their darkest hour. Thank you very much, Yaroslav, and through you, uh, a big thanks to our entire Ukrainian Canadian community here in Ottawa for how they have stepped up, and along with them, the broader community who've been, who've been there to support Ukrainians as they are coming and settled here in Ottawa, and we see this across the country. Um, thank you, Minister, for this important announcement, and I want to thank both Ivan and James for being here with us. I believe this is the opportunity for uh, open um, the microphones to have questions from our friends yes, from the I, media, I, and uh, uh, we'll answer those questions. Thank you. Hi, it's Isabel here from Media Relations, so we're just going to ask uh, reporters to uh, make their way to the microphone for the question and answer period. We're going to take one question, one follow-up, and we're, go we're going to alternate uh, from the floor and reporters that are joining us uh, via the teleconference. Um, donc, uh, je vais vous demander uh, de vouloir vous approcher pour ceux qui sont ici uh, au micro. On va prendre une question, une question suivie, et on va alterner entre les gens qui sont en présentiel et les gens qui sont en mode téléconférence. Donc, uh, s'il vous plaît, veuillez vous présenter avec votre nom et votre organisation. Please uh, introduce yourself with your name and your outlet. Thank you. Bonjour, Boris Prou du journal Le Devoir. Monsieur le ministre Fraser, j'espère que vous m'entendez bien. Euh, vous avez donné quelques détails ce matin sur la négociation avec les États-Unis concernant l'entente sur les tiers pays sûrs. J'aimerais savoir clairement de votre part, qu'est-ce que le Canada est prêt à offrir aux États-Unis pour la renégociation de cette entente? Uh, merci pour la question. Uh, quand j'ai visité uh, mon homologue à États-Unis récemment et uh, après le, le voyager aux États-Unis, uh, uh, nous avons des, des autres conversations aussi. Uh, C'est dans l'intérêt des de États-Unis pour uh, promouvoir une frontière avec uh, l'ordre et, et le contrôle uh, et aussi pour, uh, pour être un bon partenaire avec le Canada. 
à la situation à la frontière euh, du sud pour les États-Unis et une situation extraordinaire aussi. Uh, it's very important uh, that we continue to work with our partners in the United States, but uh, it's not necessarily something that we need to um, uh, horse trade over. Uh, this is something that both Canada and the United States believe in, is having uh, an orderly policy at uh, all of our borders, uh, but also welcoming immigration policies to those who are fleeing violence, war, uh, or persecution. Uh, when we're dealing with our partners, figuring out how we can mutually address not just the situation at our border, uh, but also the uh, larger scale issue of irregular migration more broadly is, is essential. Uh, whatever uh, solution we may work towards, uh, as between Canada and the United States, we know that irregular migration is an issue of global concern that's going to require long-term cooperation so we can build capacity in source countries where people feel uh, the need to flee, so we can address the root causes of migration and continue to promote an orderly migration system with welcoming policy. Uh, my sense is the United States is willing to be a good partner because they care about these issues more than they want to extract commitments from Canada that serve for their exclusive interest. Combien proches sommes-nous d'une entente avec les États-Unis? How, how close are we of uh, a deal with the United States? Do you think it will happen right here now this week with the, the visit of President Joe Biden? Uh, it's not, I, I want to be very respectful of the conversations I have that are confidential in nature with uh, our, our partners in the United States, of course. Uh, what I can say is we're working towards a solution that will uh, not just uh, deal with political issues that may be uh, in the news over the next few days, but will provide an actual lasting solution. Uh, my sense is that uh, there's a willingness uh, with an excellent partner and my counterpart and Secretary Mayorkas uh, because he believes uh, in the need to uh, continue to promote uh, uh, strong policies at our border that maintain open doors for vulnerable people. Uh, my perspective is that these conversations need to continue. Uh, there's more work to do, uh, but uh, we, we have no shortage of uh, uh, a partner in the United States who is our largest, most significant, and most important partner uh, in, in global politics. Thank you, Minister. Uh, operator, do we have uh, someone queued in on the teleconference line for a question? Thank you. So if you have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Si vous avez une question, veuillez appuyer sur étoile 1 maintenant. Our first question over the phone is from Janice Dixon from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Avez-vous la parole? Hi, Minister. Thanks so much for taking your questions uh, today. I'm wondering, you, and I, I know you've likely gotten this question before, but I've heard from quite a few Ukrainian families um, who are really, you know, say they, they lack support in helping their relatives who have come here or their friends. And, you know, they are treated differently than refugees in that support. So can you explain why the government is going ahead with the visa process um, instead of the normal refugee program? Uh, certainly. There's a number of reasons why we chose to uh, launch a, a new kind of program uh, more than a year ago uh, and why we're choosing to extend those supports today. Uh, at the outset, uh, we came to realize that uh, an ordinary refugee resettlement program uh, did not have the capacity to move at speed or at such a large scale. We made the decision after we had conversations with uh, people on the ground who saw what was taking place, including our ambassador, uh, that we needed to increase the ambition of our immigration response given the enormous scale of people fleeing Ukraine in the early days of the war and, of course, uh, since. Um, our refugee resettlement programs, because they draw on uh, the annual immigration levels plan, require us to set a finite number and require us to work very closely with different settlement partners and to advance supports that would have limited our ability to help a, uh, such a large number of people. By creating a, a brand new program that provides a temporary humanitarian visa, we've been able to leverage the strength of communities, of partners uh, that may be operating on the ground, whether that's organizations or families or employers, to essentially use uh, a modified version of our tourism system, which does not have a cap on the number of people that we can process each year. By moving towards a temporary humanitarian visa, we've been able to help significantly larger numbers of people than would have otherwise been the case. I, I'm actually quite uh, uh, pleased with the results, despite some lessons we've learned along the way, uh, because we now have a model that can offer temporary protection uh, where it did not exist before. Uh, I hope that this can be applied in other circumstances when people do flee uh, a situation that demands temporary protection. Uh, of course, when I speak to the vast majority of Ukrainians who've arrived here, 
their hope is that Ukraine is going to win this war. Uh, they want to go home one day uh, to create a program that allows them to have temporary safe haven in Canada uh, while we await uh, the circumstances on the ground uh, becoming safe one day for people to return has allowed us to help um, tens of thousands uh, of people uh, more than would otherwise have been the case under a traditional refugee resettlement model. Thanks very much for that. And I have a, a question for, uh, for a colleague on a different issue. Um, is, is it the government's position that the only way to end the migration flow at Roxham Road mm -hmm. is to extend the safe third country agreement across the whole border? Um, there is so much more uh, to the uh, issue of irregular migration into Canada that needs to be addressed before we can actually have a meaningful conversation about stemming the flow of people who enter Canada in an irregular way. Uh, I'd remind those who may be listening that it's um, people make asylum claims not just by virtue of uh, crossing at Roxham Road, but through a number of other uh, means as well. Uh, although we do need to address uh, the situation at Roxham Road, uh, we also need to advance measures that support people when they're here, but stem uh, the issue before people choose to leave. We need to continue to our work in capacity building in Central and South America. We need to continue our work by promoting regular pathways so people see an opportunity to come to Canada that doesn't require them to undertake a lengthy and often perilous journey that puts themselves and their families at risk. Uh, there are no simple solutions to an issue as complex and widespread as irregular migration. Uh, part of the solution will, of course, be negotiating a strengthened safe third country agreement with the United States. But even after uh, that portion of the solution may be advanced, uh, the issue of irregular migration will require our continued uh, uh, efforts and, and uh, uh, measures to be put forward if we're going to uh, maintain that control of the border uh, with uh, a compassionate policy for vulnerable people seeking refuge in Canada. Hi, Minister. Uh, Rachel Haynes here from CTV National News. So this announcement that you're making today on extending the CUAET, it was about to expire at the end of the month. And as we know, the war is still going on. And there is no way of knowing if it'll be over by the extension that you've given, which is July 2023. Why not wait until the end of the conflict to set an expiration date? And if the war is not over by July, do you promise to make an extension again? Um, today's announcement obviously extends only till July 15th, the application period, but we will undertake to continue to monitor the situation on the ground. Um, one of the things that we want to uh, maintain is the ability to manage our immigration system with some uh, certainty. I would encourage people who are thinking of uh, coming to Canada uh, to apply to come, and, and if you need Canada's protection, to come. Uh, those people who do apply uh, will obviously benefit from a period during which they can come here. The suet itself is uh, three years, but when we're trying to bake some certainty into the level of support so we can plan not just in the immigration system, uh, but more broadly the amount of support that we'll need to provide to vulnerable people, uh, it helps to create uh, certain time-limited dates on, on programs. Uh, so in addition to the application period, uh, if you're thinking of coming to Canada, we're extending access to benefits for people who may arrive up until the end of March next year. So people who are thinking about coming here, who may be concerned about the situation on the ground, I encourage them to apply, uh, but we will take decisions based on the conditions on the ground as, uh, as things progress and we understand what policies may be required to continue to support Ukraine, uh, given what they may be dealing with in the future. Thank you. And my follow-up is looking more broadly at all newcomers to Canada. Um, there's a new report out today that shows that more than a million people immigrated to Canada last year, but many people are still struggling to find affordable housing and new construction is below what experts are saying is needed. So what will your government do to fix this and address the need for more affordable housing for Canadians and newcomers? Uh, thank you. This is a very important question. Uh, affordable housing and housing more broadly uh, will become a bottleneck one day to Canada's economic growth. Uh, we need to continue to pursue growth, including population growth, uh, but we need to uh, continue to increase our ambition when it comes to housing policy, to build more housing stock, uh, to make sure that people are protected at the same time, and to make it more affordable for people to enter the market or receive housing supports if they cannot afford it uh, through below market affordable housing programs. Uh, Minister Hussein and I actually sit immediately adjacent to one another in the House of Commons, and we talk about this frequently. Uh, from an immigration policy point of view, there's certain things that we are doing and can do to help 
reduce the pressure on Canada's housing sector. Uh, the first is by creating programs that encourage people to go to parts of the country that have more absorptive capacity than some of our largest urban centres. Of course, our big cities have always been a magnet for newcomers to Canada, but what we've seen over the past few years is explosive growth, including through immigration in Atlantic Canada, for example, through the adoption of the Atlantic Immigration Program. The fastest growing cities in Canada, number one and number two, are Moncton and Halifax. And it's not just those cities in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, but small towns and rural communities that are seeing people come as well. We've also introduced expanded version of the rural and northern immigration pilot, and we've increased the provincial nominee program numbers. So newcomers to Canada will be spread out uh, across the country in a more equitable way, so to speak. In addition to making sure that we're encouraging people to go to communities that have housing capacity, we're also making a serious change to the federal express entry system that will kick in in the second half of this year. For the first time, we'll be able to select newcomers under the express entry system, not just by their overall score, but based on the sector that they work in and the part of Canada that they're going to. I've been clear in my public comments on this new measure to date that we're going to include targeted draws for people who have the skills that are necessary to build more houses. One of the biggest bottlenecks when I speak to developers is not that they don't have projects that they can build, it's they don't have the people to build the projects they're already planning on. By continuing to bring workers into the country that are essential to key sectors that are serving as bottlenecks to growth, including housing, we can actually help use immigration to mitigate against these challenges rather than exacerbate them. Again, no simple solutions, but by looking both in where people go and what people come in, uh, we can help advance solutions to housing rather than treating immigration as a source of the problem. We don't have anyone uh, on the phone. Bonjour, Monsieur le Ministre, Rina Silbardo de Franco Press. Est-ce que c'est OK si je pose ma question en français Oui, si vous parlez plus lent, c'est OK. OK. <rire> um, il y a eu une réponse de votre gouvernement aujourd'hui sur l'équité dans les décisions d'immigration. Et votre ministère uh, est partiellement d'accord pour élargir les mesures spéciales aux Ukrainiens, aux populations d'autres pays en crise. Moi, je voulais vous demander si um, c'était une manière de traiter différemment les personnes um, qui venaient d'autres pays en crise. Je me suis c'est difficile pour moi de comprendre les questions. Okay, les questions. In English, then? Yeah, yeah, c'est ok. Je, je vais essayer. J'ai envie de pratiquer mon français, mais uh, uh, <laughs> j'ai posé une, uh, donné une réponse en français si, si possible. So in, okay. Yeah, if you can yeah. ask the question, yeah. it might help. Sure. So, um, the, earlier today, uh, in the government's response, there was a, um, a release that uh, your department is. Um, sorry for my English. It's no, so no, bad. Okay. <laughs> c'est mieux comme en français. <laughs> So your department states that um, it's um, it, it's okay for uh, it's partially it is partially agreed uh, with extending special measures to Ukrainian uh, to populations in other countries in crisis. Uh, so I was asking myself, uh, isn't that half of what it say about di discrimination against against the countries in crisis, other countries? Um, C'est OK si, si j'ai donné une réponse en anglais? OK. Um, look, this is a, a, a very important uh, subject. I think we have to be uh, very mindful uh, of uh, advancing policies uh, that don't foster a culture of discrimination. Uh, of course, both internal to government and the outward Im facing impact of our policies. Uh, it's no secret that over the course of Canada's history uh, that discrimination, systemic discrimination, is a, a very real thing. Um, when it comes to the specific policies that we've uh, dealt with here, um, we've tried to tailor a response that meets the needs of a unique crisis. Uh, when we saw millions of people fleeing over the course of weeks, uh, we made a decision uh, to advance a first-of-its-kind uh, temporary humanitarian visa uh, to make sure that the uh, community of nations who are supporting Ukraine came to understand this wasn't a European problem. Uh, this was an issue the entire world needed to respond to. By creating the capacity for people to, who were fleeing Ukraine to come to Canada, we also helped increase the capacity of European nations uh, for whom Ukrainians had access to travel more easily to continue to uh, grow their capacity to help more vulnerable people who had fled. Um, but it's not lost on me that there are other vulnerable parts of the world as well. And we do what we can to respond to the needs of different communities. Just this past weekend, for example, we announced a, a temporary protection model for people who've been impacted by the earthquake in Syria and Turkey, uh, who will have the opportunity to apply, apply for a temporary residence visa to come to Canada and to have people who are already here to stay. Uh, when we saw uh, the events after the murder of Masa Amini in Iran, 
and we met with uh, communities of Iranians who are in Canada now, uh, we heard that the main concern was not the need to create a new refugee program, but to protect people who were already here who had participated in protests. So we advanced new measures to give them an extended period to stay here in Canada. When previously we had dealt with a situation in Afghanistan where we need people who don't have the ability to come temporarily, but uh, would need to come permanently because the real, uh, realistic situation is that despite the fact that Afghans love their homeland as much as Ukrainians do, as much as Canadians do, um, those who fled the Taliban have no realis realistic prospect of going home. And they're heartbroken when they tell you they would like to, but no, it's not possible. And to the answer I gave previously, we were required to come up with a permanent residency program an or, uh, uh, that relied on the traditional refugee resettlement model with some unique innovations uh, to provide permanent safe haven to Afghans who fled, including those who served Canada. Uh, we're going to continue to see how we can use the lessons we've learned in response to Ukraine to apply them to help more vulnerable people around the world. Um, there's no perfect solution to any one crisis, but we're going to continue to try to tailor our response to the unique needs of an individual crisis, regardless of where in the world it may take place. Thank you. And uh, what are the main criteria uh, that your department uh, is aiming to determine which persons from countries in crisis will be refugees and who will not? Uh, when we're trying to advance, um, and, and we, we are actually undertaking a strategic review of our immigration policies, including specifically when and how we're going to respond to humanitarian crises around the world. Um, when we look at challenges that other nations in the world may be facing, uh, before we make a decision to uh, launch a new substantial uh, refugee resettlement policy, uh, we look to see whether the events giving rise to the humanitarian crisis uh, trigger a migration crisis as well. In Ukraine, with millions of people fleeing in a matter of weeks, uh, there was clearly a need to respond. Uh, in Afghanistan, where people were fleeing the Taliban who'd uh, seized control of the territory uh, and would persecute the people who would remain, it was very clear there was a need to respond. Uh, when people who had their homes destroyed by the earthquake uh, on the uh, Turkish-Syrian border uh, lost their homes temporarily, or lost their homes permanently, but desire to go back home, uh, we uh, discovered there was a need to respond with a temporary program. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, work to identify the strengths of our uh, immigration and refugee resettlement programs, but also the gaps to understand how we can advance uh, more quickly and more substantial protections for people in need. Of course, the guiding principle will be giving protection to the world's most vulnerable, and uh, over the course of this review, which we expect to be completed by May of this year, uh, we should have a clear understanding of how we can respond and how we can grow our capacity to respond without having impacts across the immigration system, as we've seen has been the case over the course of the past year and a half. Thank you. That was the last question. I'm sorry. Uh, we will take your Can questions and questions offer. Questions no. Um, I, um, I know we've got a pretty hard stop, but if we want to follow up, I can try to make myself available uh, subsequently, if, if that's okay. I think, we're, we, we, I think we have to get to the House of Commons very soon. Yeah, that's um, correct. So I will take your questions and get them to the Minister's office. And, and we'll undertake to get you a response in a timely way. I, I hate walking away from questions when they remain, but we, we do have a, a hard stop to get back to the House of Commons before question period. Um, look, I'll very, very quickly, um, and that is a question that requires significantly more time than I have right now. Um, we want to work with the Ukrainian-Canadian community to understand what the needs are. There's also some very real sensitivities that the government of Ukraine has expressed, uh, making sure that they still ha have access to the people who are going to facilitate the reconstruction phase of Ukraine after they win this war. We're going to make decisions not just based on our ideas behind closed doors in Ottawa, but based on engagement with Ukraine, its government, and importantly, Ukrainian-Canadian community. And when we have more to say about uh, long-term visions for the, what comes next, of course, we'll share that publicly, uh, but not without doing proper consultations with the community first. Um, look, thank you so much, everyone. I hate to run. Uh, C'est un plaisir d'être ici avec vous. Uh, merci pour être ici. And we'll look forward to our next uh, conversation. Thank you, everyone. Okay. <laughs>